Okay, these are some simulations of what goes on in the potential barrier case. But this, this doesn't only solve the, pot there's also the potential well problem. You see now you have this wave packet arriving. You see, classically speaking, there is nothing to prevent the particle to just go through. But what quantum mechanics tells us is that because of there is this potential change, there is a finite probability that it will bounce back. It's just as if you are just walking straight, there is a step over here, and rather than going forward, you just bounce back. The probability is finite. This phenomenon is very similar to tunneling. Yes, there is such simulation in a moment. These are for various energy values. You see, the energy is now twice the... You see, this is when the energy is half the barrier height. This is when the energy is equal to the barrier height. You see, the probability of tunnel is, is actually very small. This is in the case when the energy, average energy of the packet is equal to the barrier height so as to maximize the tunneling probability. No, this one, this is a new simulation. You say this is, you see here, the way, this is our initial wave packet. This is the initial wave packet. So it has an average position over somewhere over here. It, the average position is moving, so it, it's now about to hit the barrier. Now it's hitting the barrier, essentially. So this is how, what the probability is. At this time, if you measure the position of the particle, you can measure it either here or inside the barrier there is a very small probability that you will measure it on the, on the other side of the barrier. The probability wave, they just keep evolving. You see, at this moment, you, see, uh, you shouldn't confuse. The wave has split, but the particle did not. Still, I have a single particle. If I try to measure its position, somewhere I will observe just one particle. I can observe, there is a large probability that I will observe it over here, reflected back. There is some finite probability that I will observe it within the barrier. And there is a very small probability that I will observe it on the other side. But when I observe it, I will observe a full particle. Well, that is a completely different problem. What happens when we make a measurement? Now, uh, it's kind of beyond the topics of this course. For example, let's say that I have made a measurement and observed the, at least the Copenhagen interpretation says that if we measure the position of the particle described by this wave, if I measure its position somewhere over here, after the measurement, the prob these probabilities, they just go to zero. And the wave is non-zero only in this region at the point where I have measured. So the measurement itself will change the wave function. I'm not going into that. We are not coming out of that. Now there's one alternative uh, interpretation says that the, in the interactions between the measuring device and the particle causes this wave function to get narrower in time, localized in one or the other region. You see, this is when the average energy of the wave is higher than the barrier. Again, classically, there is no reason for the particle to bounce back. It will just go straight. But this is what quantum mechanics tells us, quantum physics. 
you see most of it just goes straight through. Nevertheless, there is a very small probability that it will bounce back. Now, this is another simulation where they have a very narrow uh, gap this time. This time, they, in the previous plot, they probably plotted the probability. Here is the wave. So when this sine wave hits a thin barrier? So that is a very thin barrier. In this, in this example, probably the barrier was very thin, the energy was high, so that the transition probability is larger than reflection probability. So um, here, uh, the last one. You see, these are all consequences of the fact that we are describing the particles as waves. And once you say that we should describe the particles as waves, all this phenomena has to be there. The, all these phenomena appear, for example, in uh, light. This tunneling phenomena is quite similar to, you, are, you have probably studied the uh, total internal reflection. So what happens in total internal reflection is that you have a, let's say you have a region over here, here the, uh, there is an uh, index of refraction. The outside, it is less than inside. So if you send a light ray with sufficiently large angle, it will just reflect all of it. But what actually happens is just outside in this region, there is a wave which is exponentially decaying. So if you put another region over here, you are essentially putting a gap with this index of refraction N1. Some of this light will just go through. Not all of it will reflect. This is the analog of the tunneling in light in classical Maxwell's equations. So all the, fun, all the things that we have discussed about the, uh, these weird properties of uh, quantum physics is due to the fact that we have discovered that we have to describe particles as waves. Even the uncertainty relation is due to the wave nature. No, 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 yes. Okay, any questions now? The solutions of the midterms are in the class already. Now, you can access the solutions, but not through uh, let's go. So if you just click the assignment four over here, you cannot access the assignments. What you need to do is you need to go to your grade book. Hmm? In the grade book. Okay. Okay, I can I cannot see them. You can see them, but so which questions did you get? Okay, then why don't you use the discussion forum in the class? That is for these things. 
you can discuss the homework if you like. Well, depends. You see, the tunneling probability is approximately given by this expression. This is of the order of 10 to power minus 38, let's say, if KL is of the order of 100. But if the probability is of the order of 1, if KL is around zero. It depends on how you create the system. What is the width of that probability? Now, do we actually see it? One model of, for example, the alpha decay, alpha radiation. Well, alpha radiation is <coughs> essentially helium nuclei. And you can model this by basically saying that, okay, the in the nuclei, the alpha particle is free, then there is a barrier, and outside this barrier, there is the electrostatic repulsion. So there is the electrostatic potential energy, which just decreases with height, with distance. So this is the potential that an alpha particle sees as a function of its distance from the center of the nuclei. So if you have a, we do measure the alpha particles, so we do know their energies, So I can calculate the probability. How many times does it need to hit this barrier so that the alpha particle can tunnel? And in fact, the number just turns out to be quite reliable to the real case. So we do observe the alpha particles. You see, what is the size of the atom, nucleus? The size of the nucleus is nucleus. Yeah, let's say 10 to the power minus 30. What is the, uh, let's say, a typical speed? Just make a guess. 1% the speed of light. Or uh, 10 to the power 3 times 10 to the power 6 meters per second. So how many times this alpha particle just goes back and forth in one second? The, or the, how, how long does it take for the alpha particle between two collisions of the alpha particle? Uh, let's say 2r over v, which is 10 to the power minus 13 meters divided by 3 times 10 to the power 6 meters per second. is 10 to the power minus uh, 19 seconds between two collisions. So you see, it's also quite fast, the frequent, the collisions. Let's say if, let's just make an estimate, if the probability is, let's say, 10 to the power minus 38, then the time required will be 10 to the power minus 19 t. No, sorry. Well, if the probability is 10 to the power minus 38, we need around 10 to the power 38 collisions per tunneling. We need this much collisions. Well, how much does it take? Ten to power 
38 collisions. Each collision takes 10 to power minus 19 seconds. So 10 to power minus 19 sec uh, second, 10 to power plus uh, 19 seconds in total. Hmm? Yes. Let's see. If we have 10 to power 19 particles, well, you see, this is also an enormous number, but not even one mole, one Avogadro's number. So if you ha have 10 to power 19 particles, that means one tunneling per second. Now, this is not an enormous number. Well, you see, it's hard to get a few atoms. It's easier to get one mole of a given atom. Well, basically, if you want to observe this, this tells you a couple of strategies. One, remove K, uh, lower KL, lower L. For example, that is what is done in scanning tunneling microscope. But both, both uh, they change L, and there's also a huge number of electrons in the system already. So since we have a huge number of electrons, the probability of having a few electrons tunneling is not so small. Other questions? Now, the, uh, in the exam, there were, uh, in the first question, asking you about the properties of the wave. How did I close it? You see this one? Do you see it? Okay. So this was our barrier. The energy was zero outside the, no, this was the well outside the potential energy is zero. So if the energy of the particle is less than zero, then we know that it is confined, confined over here. There's no probability of observing it at infinity. So this is correct. The wave function should, the probability should go to zero as x goes to infinity. But if the energy is larger than zero, the particle can go up to infinity. So the probability of observing my particle at infinity need not be zero. That is why this is wrong. Well, wave function is continuous everywhere because the, its derivative is momentum, and the momentum should be finite. If the wave function is not continuous, it means the derivative is infinite, and hence the momentum is infinite. That cannot be. That is why the wave function has to be continuous. Well, the derivative is kind of problematic. You see, the derivative is the momentum. Momentum should change continuously. That's why, in fact, we require the derivative to be continuous. Also, the kinetic energy is the second derivative, which should also be finite. But there is one exception to this. If the potential is jumping, you see, if the potential is jumping, or if the potential is infinite, in fact, like on the right-hand side, then the derivative need not be continuous because that represents a finite impulse. If you remember what an impulse is, it's just an infinite force that delivers a momentum change instantaneously. So an infinite potential like this would deliver an infinite impulse classically, and quantum mechanically, it basically amounts to saying that the derivative need not be continuous. So the derivative at x is equal to 0 is continuous, but not at x is equal to L. And this is... No. For example, we studied the particle in a box. The particle in a box with infinite, well, infinite walls. 
So there the derivative is not continuous. And now we have this condition. Well, you see, the total probability should be 1. But the particle in this problem, at least, can be, uh, even, if, even though e is less than 0, yes, e is less than 0. So we know that the wave function should be some oscillating function over here and decaying exponentially over here and 0 over there. The total probability to the left of L should be 1 not just from 0 to L. This is the probability that the particle is inside the well, not the total probability. The lower limit should be minus infinite for this to be correct. And finally, this is also wrong because it can go to uh, x less than 0. The g. Well, this was kind of a hint for g. You see, even if the energy is less than 0, x less than 0 is classically forbidden. If the energy is less than 0, the particle cannot be, classically speaking, the particle cannot be somewhere over here. But what quantum mechanics tells us is that uh, the, the wave function in this region will not be 0. So there is a finite probability of observing the particle at x less than 0. So the probability of observing the particle at x less than 0 is not 0. What else we know? The total probability should be 1. The total probability would be the probability that the particle is at x less than 0 plus the probability that it is between 0 and L. The probability of observing the particle at x larger than L is 0. So this should be, this plus the probability of observing it at x less than 0 should be 1. That means this cannot be 1. This has to be less than 1. OK, for the other uh, solutions, you can just check the uh, solutions. That is in the, on the first page. The Bohr's quantization condition should be on the first page. No? Let's see. If it's not there, you didn't ask for it. <laughs> okay. Don't forget to ask for it in the final. Okay, the wavelength, the ray circumference has to be an integer multiple of the circumference. That's, that's the principle, in a sense. It's, it's just a single expression, just a one equality equation. <laughs> no, it's not worth 20 points. The part B was independent of it. OK, let, let's go with the quantum mechanics of the hydrogen atom. <coughs> well, we were basically, uh, OK, we had our hand-waving arguments. We had looked at the particle in a box. We had looked at the hydrogen atom using the, the Bohr's approach. Now, and then we developed the uh, quantum mechanics. We have developed the Schrodinger's equation, which is supposed to describe all the uh, quantum phenomena. 
And then we had studied several of the, uh, our pre earlier applications using the uh, Schrodinger's equation. We looked at the particle in a box using Schrodinger's equation. There was something new, which was this tunneling phenomena. Now let's look at the quantum, uh, the hydrogen atom, which we had already studied using the Bohr's model. And let's see if the Schrodinger's equation will answer some of the questions we have about the hydrogen atom. And if the uh, Schrodinger's equation predicts the Bohr model results. Well, as usual, if we, are, we want to find the possible energy values of the, hydrogen, the electron in the hydrogen atom, so this is the equation we need to solve. And in this case, the, this our a operator, as usual, it's, it's always p squared over 2m plus u of r. But this time, it's a three-dimensional problem. Well, if you like, you can use the Cartesian coordinates. Well, since it's a hydrogen, it's just E squared over R. This is the potential. Well, on one hand, you have the spherical coordinate. If you like, you can express this as the square root of X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. But then it becomes quite complicated. So what we usually do is rather than using the X, Y, Z coordinates, we go to the spherical coordinates. So R X is equal to R uh, sine theta cosine phi, y is equal to r sine theta sine phi, and z is equal to r cosine theta. Well, in terms of these r theta and phi, our Schrodinger equation takes this form, minus h bar squared over 2m, d squared psi by del r squared plus 1 over r squared cosine theta, del over del theta, cosine theta, del psi by del theta, plus 1 over r squared sine squared theta, del squared psi by del phi squared, minus 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, e squared over r psi is equal to e of psi. Okay, this is our Schrodinger's equation. Let me check. Well, let, let me check that. I'm ha happy that I can remember even this much. Okay, those are signs. This is sine theta. This is also sine theta. Now oh, let me see. Tangent phi is sine over cos uh, y over x. No, it's correct. This is the expression in the book. Well, in the book, it says that phi is equal to tangent inverse y over x, or tangent phi is equal to y over x. And, well, if you would like to visualize these angles, if you just take this point, this is x, this is y, that is z. You just take the projection on the xy plane. They say this is the image on the xy plane. And then you imagine this is our point P connecting your point to the origin and connecting the image to the origin. 
So this is 90 degrees. This angle over here is theta. This angle over here is phi. No. Hmm? Well, that is the, they are using the wrong convention. No, at least this is the convention we use. And now we have this differential equation to solve. And unfortunately, if you have a second order uh, differential equation or higher order differential equation, we don't really have any uh, general framework to solve them. But luckily, we don't have any general equation over there. This equation has a solution that can be found using what's called the separation of variables. You see, the wave function will be a function of r theta and phi. So we assume that this can be written in the form of a function of r only, another function of theta only, and another function of phi only. And then we will try to find all solutions of our equation that, that has this form. Then if we have more than one such solution, their superposition will be also a solution. So we can, gen if we find uh, all the solutions that have this form, then just summing them up, we can find even more solutions of the Schrodinger's equation. But then there is the question, does all the solutions of the Schrodinger equation, can all of them be written as a superposition of solutions of this form? And our mathematicians friends, although they are using the wrong conventions, uh, they are nice to prove that yes, any solution of this Schrodinger's e this equation, in fact, can be written as a superposition of solutions of this form. So we are not losing actually anything. So we study these, and then we study the, super the so superpositions of these, and any solution can be written in terms of those. Okay, so. How does this give us any simplification? Well, this is our equation to start with. If you put that solution here, you see here we have a partial derivative with respect to the radial coordinate. Well, if you look at over here, only this function depends on the radial coordinate, and it only and this function depends only on the radial coordinate. So all these partial derivatives with respect to r now becomes a total derivative of this function only with respect to r. Similarly, derivatives with respect to theta becomes the total derivatives of this function with respect to theta, and the derivatives with respect to phi becomes derivative, total derivatives of this function with respect to theta. So let me just write it down. So we have minus h bar squared over 2m. Well, let me just ignore the arguments. r double prime theta and phi plus 1 over r squared sine theta d by d theta sine theta theta prime. r phi plus well, the rest, r theta phi double prime. No, what the book does is it multiplies with r squared sine uh, r squared sine theta. So here there's an r squared in the book probably. Oh, sorry, this is not the total derivative. This is one over r squared times r squared del psi by del r. Okay, this is not the derivative with second derivative with respect to r. 
but 1 over r squared derivative with respect to r of r squared times derivative of psi with respect to r. Thank you. So here, this becomes 1 over r squared derivative with respect to of r of r squared r prime. OK, fine. Now, what I will do is first divide everywhere by r, theta, and phi. So these terms just become some constants. So we get minus h bar squared over 2m, 1 over r squared, 1 over r, derivative with respect to r of r squared r prime. Because theta and phi, they just canceled when I divide it by r, theta, and phi. If I come to the second term, this time, theta and phi will cancel plus 1 over r squared sine theta d by d theta sine theta theta prime divided by theta plus 1 over r squared sine squared theta r theta phi no, d is cancelled phi double prime over phi minus the rest, or let me write it, plus e minus 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 e squared over r. OK, this is now our equation. Now let's look at it a bit. You see, this equation has to be satisfied at every point. Every three numbers are theta and phi. You give me the three numbers are theta and phi, and this number, this equation should be satisfied for those values. Now let's see. Let's look at this term. What does this term depend on? Among these r theta and phi. This only depends on r. It doesn't depend on theta, it doesn't depend on phi. As I change theta and phi, this term remains constant. Let's look at this term. Well, this term depends on r and depends on theta. But it doesn't depend on phi. As I change phi, this term doesn't change. As I change phi, this term doesn't change. As I change phi, this term doesn't change. But remember, this equation has to be satisfied everywhere. So if, as I change phi, this doesn't change, this doesn't change, this doesn't change, so the remaining term should also shouldn't change as I change phi. But you see, r squared already doesn't change as I change phi. Sine squared theta doesn't change as I change phi. So this shouldn't change as I change phi. But you see, this is a function of phi. So it should be such a function of phi that if I take its second derivative, divide by itself, it should be constant. This should be constant. Otherwise, this equation that we wrote over here cannot be satisfied at every point r theta and phi. Nothing else. Well, now we have to solve this. You see, actually, it can also be exponential. The exponential also satisfies this. OK, it can be the, well, let's look at the cases. Phi double prime over phi can be positive. Or phi double prime over phi can be negative or equal to 0. But you see, we have certain constraints. Psi is a function of r, theta, and phi. If you choose a point, the value of this point should be independent of how I describe that point. But the same point I can describe as having a phi angle of phi plus 2 pi. So if I choose a given phi to describe that point, or if I choose phi plus 2 pi to describe the same point, it's, like, it's the same point. 
But this tells me that this function phi should be periodic. And if function phi is periodic, it's sec it should be a sines and cosines. It cannot be just exponentially decaying or exponentially increasing function because they are not periodic. So this basically tells me that phi double prime over phi should be less than or equal to zero. Either it is constant or it's, it should be an oscillating function. And let's call that constant to be minus m squared. Hmm? Well, what do we know? We know that it has to be a constant. Do you agree? OK, so it has to be a constant. Well, that constant can be positive, but it can also be negative. At this point, we don't know. But what else do we know about this function phi? The wave function should be single valued at every point. So that tells me that that function phi has to be uh, periodic. Well, that equation, phi double prime over phi is equal to constant, has oscillating solutions if that ratio is negative, or it has exponentially decaying or increasing solutions if it is positive. But if, it has, if you have the exponentially decaying or increasing solutions, they are not periodic. They cannot repeat itself. So that already tells us that phi double prime over phi has to be negative, because only in that case we have periodic solutions. And so since phi double prime over phi is negative, it, it, is, it can be written as minus a positive number. And any positive number I can write as the square of some number. And the solutions are e to the power i m phi or e to the power minus i m phi. In fact, any superposition of these two will work. Well, what I will do is, you see, here m squared is positive. Plus, taking an m value plus 5 or minus 5 actually gives me the same m squared. If this is plus 5, I will say that this corresponds to the minus 5. So I will choose phi of phi to be equal to some coefficient times e to the power i m phi, where here, m, just at least for the time being, any number. So if I write it in this form with allowing m to take any value, positive or negative, I already take into account this solution and also this solution. And keep in mind, eventually, I will be taking their superposition. Now, what else do we know? Well, we still know that we didn't use completely the periodicity. So this is if I add 2 pi to its argument. But it has to be equal to the value of the function at initial value of phi, which is a e to the power i m phi. So this number and this number, they should be equal. But that tells me that this should be 1. e to the power 2 pi m i should be equal to 1, which tells me that m is an integer. Not just any uh, real number. It has to be an integer. It can be positive or negative. Now, what does it mean physically? We will discuss it later on once we discuss this, how we solved it. So now, part of the equation is solved.
This is not mass. Uh, if you want, uh, well, if you want to use the reduced mass, well, this m is the reduced mass, if you like. I mean, this is the reduced mass. Let me use the capital M over here, not to confuse with the other integer m. Well, this M, you can choose if, the, if you assume the nucleus is at rest, then this M will be the mass of the electron. If you want to take into account the also vibration, the motion of the nucleus, then that capital M is the reduced mass of the system. And this small M is just some integer. It's not the mass of anything. Well, let's go back to our e equation. We have solved part of this. You see, this one over here, we had now calculated, and we know that it has to be minus m squared, m being some integer. Now, let me try to simplify it a bit. Let me, I will be just rewriting the same equation, minus h bar squared over 2m, 1 over r squared, 1 over r, d over dr, plus 1 over r squared, d over d theta, sine theta, theta prime. Minus m squared over sine squared theta. Plus now everything is closest, e minus 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, e squared over r squared. This should be equal to 0. Now, again, this is an equation for the arguments r and theta. There's no phi anymore. We had already solved for phi and put it over, over here anyway. Uh, there is also sin theta. <coughs> hmm? It's over here. You see, there is this r squared is multiplying this sine squared anyway. Here, there is the sine theta. You are right. Now, again, this equation, we will just basically do the same trick. This equation should be satisfied at every value of r and theta. Now, this part doesn't change as I change theta. This part doesn't change as I change theta. It only depends on r over here. Here, this function depends only on the coordinate r. Only the coordinate r explicitly appears. So if this term doesn't depend on theta, this term doesn't depend on theta, this term should also be independent of theta. Well, there is no theta over here, so this parentheses over here should be a constant. Yes. Well, whichever one you like. What appears over there is phi double prime over phi. This is what appears in my equation. If you want to use the exponential, put it over here. If you calculate phi double prime over phi, you will get minus m squared. That is why we got the exponential. You see here, we already said that phi should be such that phi double prime over phi should be a negative number. And that number we call minus m squared. OK, this, the solution of this equation is somewhat more complicated. But we know that 
the conditions, we have to impose some conditions. You see, before we obtained the differential equation for phi, we said that phi double prime over phi should be a constant. We, had, we knew nothing about that constant phi until we imposed the conditions. And the condition we had in that case was that the function phi should be periodic in its argument. Now here, again, there are many solutions of this for positive uh, constant, for negative constant. But there is one condition. The condition we impose is that theta is finite everywhere. For all values of its argument, this function should be finite. Or theta of theta is finite for theta between 0 and pi. There's no uh, periodicity over here, but the condition we have is that it has to be finite. And this function, this constant has to, if this is to be satisfied, that constant turns out to be minus L, L plus 1. And the solutions are what are called Legendre functions, PLM of cosine theta. Okay, what are these special functions? At this moment, we don't really care. We don't need to know anything about them. Just know that we have the equation for theta. It has to be f constant. And have you studied the, how to solve such differential equations using the series expansion, Taylor's expansion? Anyway, so you will learn it eventually. The solutions of these equations diverge in general when theta is equal to zero or theta is equal to pi. You see already the sine theta is kind of problematic. Sine zero is zero, sine pi is zero. So this one over sine theta, it just becomes infinite. So unless that function theta is, has special properties, then this equation basically doesn't make sense that theta is equal to zero or pi. And that properties appear only if the constant has a special form. Here, L can, take, can be any integer. If L can be any integer, and there's one additional condition that M should be less than or equal to L. If those conditions are not satisfied, then you don't have any solution for theta, which is finite. And then finally, this is not periodic. Hmm. But you see, theta is restricted. You see, phi can take value from 0 to pi. You see, that is kind of problematic because theta is equal to zero point and theta, no, phi is equal to zero point and phi is equal to two pi point. They are the, actually the same point. So if you want phi to be single valued, it has to be periodic in two pi. You cannot avoid it. But theta is only defi defined between zero and pi. Theta is equal to pi point and theta is equal, theta is equal to pi is the my negative z axis. Theta is equal to zero is the positive z axis. So there's no periodicity requirement for theta. <laughs> sure, but you see the equation is well defined even when theta is equal to zero. You see, if theta has all those properties, if you put it over here, well, there, there are additional sine thetas from theta which cancel this one, essentially. So there's no problem. And then finally, we have the remaining equation, 
Well, we already said that this part over here has to be minus 1 L, L plus 1. Now, if you just play with it a bit, it will take this form. 1 over R, D over DR, R squared, the first derivative, plus 2M R squared over H bar squared, <coughs> E squared over 4 pi epsilon 0 R. No, sorry, here, uh, this is minus E. This was minus E all along. You see, E was on the right, we moved it to the left. It becomes minus E. Plus E equals L, L plus 1. And here, we need the requirement that this capital R should go to 0. As r goes to infinity and is less than infinity as r goes to 0. It has to be finite at the origin and it has to be 0 at infinity. And these conditions are satisfied only if En is equal to E1 over N squared n being 1, 2, 3, etc. And n is larger than L, is larger than or equal to M. So these are the conditions we have. Now we have the Bohr's condition, Bohr's quantized energy values. From that equation over there, the solutions that satisfy these two boundary conditions exist only if the E has such a form where E1 is the ground state energy calculated using Bohr's model. So now, at least this Schrodinger picture contains the Bohr's picture. But now we have other states. You see, for a given, the Bohr just predicts the n quantum number. n is called the principal quantum number. It, it's the principal quantum number because it determines the energy of the state. You see, the energy depends only on the value of n. Then there is the L, which is called the orbital quantum number, and M, the magnetic quantum number. We will see why it's called magnetic uh, problem next week. So essentially, this gives us the solution of the hydrogen atom. Well, we didn't write down the explicitly, but if just to give an idea, for example, the wave function now depends on three quantum numbers, n, l, and m. So if you write the psi, let's say, 2, 1, 0, this is equal to, just to give an idea of how they look like, Uh, this is the wave function for psi 2, 1, 0. There is no phi dependence because m is 0, it's power i, m phi is just 1. It's properly normalized, etc. So now you have the wave function. You can try to calculate the expectation values or whatever you would like to calculate. Now you can go ahead and try to calculate, well, the Bohr model made several predictions. One prediction was the energies. This uh, quantum picture tells us what the energies should be. The other one, the Bohr model gave us the uh, radi possible radii. And if you try to calculate the radius for the quantum numbers n, l, and m, well, Bohr model prediction for the possible radius was 
n squared a0. But if you use, for example, this wave function corresponding to n is equal to 2, if you try to calculate this one, you won't get 4a0. But if you calculate the expectation value of 1 over r, this should be 1 over n squared a0. So in a sense, even the possible radii are over here. Just a warning, the average of any operator is not, uh, or 1 over the average of an operator is not equal to the average of the inverse of that operator. They are different things. This is why this and this, they are consistent. Why should they be equal? Hmm? Yes? No. No, we never equated them. Well, let's calculate it. Well, here we have our wave function. For this wave function, let's calculate the average value of r. Well, this is d cubed r. We are integrating over all space. It should be psi star r, r psi, of course, not just r, r theta and phi, r psi of r theta and phi for two one zero states. This will be equal to 1 over 16 times 2 pi times a0 cube times 1 over a0 squared d cubed r. Well, in the wave function, there is an r. One r from here, another r from here, a third one over there, that's r cubed e to the power minus r over a0. Well, I have e to the power minus r over 2a0 from this one, and e to the power minus r over 2a0 from this one. So it gives me an e to the power minus r over a0. And then I have cosine squared theta. This should be it. No, it's just a, a no, cosine squared. No. That's, you see, this is a three-dimensional volume element. It also has the theta integral over there. So this will be equal to 1 over 32 pi a0 to the fifth power. The integral from Well, you see, this is d cubed r, sometimes denoted as d3x, sometimes called dx, dy, dz, sometimes called r squared dr, d cosine theta, d phi. I have a three-dimensional problem, so I'm integrating over all three coordinates to calculate the expectation values. In the final, don't forget to ask for the explicit expression of this one. Well, now we can calculate the integrals. 1 over 32 pi a0 to the fifth power. Well, phi integral, nothing depends on phi in this problem. So it just gives me 2 pi 
I have the R integral e to the power minus R over A0. And then I have the cosine theta integral. Let me just call the cosine theta as z. It's not the z coordinate, it's just the cosine theta. The z, z squared. Well, here we can make a change of variable. I can just define r to be a0 times x. B, OK, if you like b. Let me call it u. And let me call this v. Well, then it becomes, OK, this 2 pi, this cancels. We have 16. 1 over 16, a0 to the fifth power. Here I have five powers of r over here, another power over here. So I get a0 to the sixth power. From 0 to infinity, the v, v to the 5, e to the power minus v. And here I get u cubed over 3 u changing from minus 1 to 1. Do you know this integral? Well, let me just write the, down the uh, explicit form. It's 6 factorial. No, it's 5 factorial, sorry. Yes. It's the factorial of this integer over there, if it's an integer. So it is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So these 4 and 2 cancels. So here we have a factor 2. We have 15 over 2, a0. And here we have 2 thirds, the integral of u cubed, u squared. When u is equal to 1, this is 1 third minus minus 1 third, so it gives me 2 thirds. So this is 5a0, which is not 2 squared a0. It's a bit large. The average radius is a bit larger. Now we can look at the average of 1 over r. for the same state. Well, I will not write them all explicitly. You see, what will change in this derivation is here I put the r over here. Now I need to put 1 over r. So I have to, uh, here, instead of r cubed, I will have just r. You see, r squared comes from psi star psi. Another factor of r is this one. So this r cubed in the new calculation just becomes a single power of r. <coughs> So here, I have a single power of r. Combined with this r squared here, I have the third power of r, not the fifth power. So let me just copy this one. And make the correction here. This is the not the fifth power, but the third power. Because inside the integral, I don't put r, I put 1 over r. I lower the power of r by a factor of 2, by 2. OK, so this is 1 over 16, a0 to the fifth power. And here I have a0 to the fourth power from 0 to infinity, dv, v cubed, e to the power minus r o minus v. This integral is just 2 thirds, that u integral. Well, let's see. Uh, this one is 3 factorial, or 6. Now, the average of 1 over r is just 1 over 16 a0. Well, these cancel. I have 2 thirds. Then I have a factor of 6. This cancels. Here we have a factor 2. These two cancel. Here we have a 4. 
So the average of 1 over r is 1 over 2 squared a0. Now, what are these wave functions? Let's see what they look like. Now, here we have a picture. Now, what do they mean? We had these three numbers, n, 0, 1, 2, etc. This is the, called the principal quantum number. L takes values from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And these are called S, P, D, F, G, H, etc. So these are the things that you hopefully remember from your chemistry courses. And then you have the m values, 0, 1, 2, etc. Et now, the orbital we had calculated over here, we had the n is equal to 2, l is equal to 1, and m is equal to 0. l is equal to 1 is the p orbital. So it's the, second, the first excited p orbital. Now, if you go back to this picture, The second excited is this one. These are the p orbitals. Well, here you have p, this is the p0. This is p1 and p minus 1. Well, they just differ by the, uh, they are, in fact, the complex conjugate of each one another. You see, the complex numbers appear only in e to the power i m phi. If you just change the sign of m, you are just taking the complex conjugate. So p minus 1 and p1, they just look the same. So what this is, these are the contour plots. You see, these surfaces are surfaces chosen such that the probability of observing the electron in them has some definite value, let's say 0 0.8. With a 0.8% probability, the electron will be observed inside this surface. Now, let's see. What does Bohr model predict? It? Bohr model predicted that the electrons were going around orbits of given radius. Does any one of these look like those? Yeah, you see this one. It says that the electron is most probably around this circle. This one, this one over here for the n is equal to 3 case, the maximum possible value of L is either 2. The maximum possible value of L is 2. That is the d orbitals. And among the d orbitals, the maximum and minimum values of m are minus 2 or plus 2. So these are the orbitals that the Bohr's model could predict. They are the complex phases. In this picture, at least, they are probably the complex phases. You see here, this one, the red is over here. On this one, the red is on the opposite side. So they are probably color-coded with the complex phase of the wave function. And <coughs> you see, what Bohr model predicts are only the cases when the L is maximum, M is maximum. Now, quantum mechanics predicts all the other states. Now, then the question is, can we observe them? Will we be able to observe those states? What sense can we give to them? Observe the consequences of those states, let's say. Because observing directly, trying to observe directly the electron, it will change the system. These are, these are the wave functions which describe the probability amplitudes. You see, th these are probably the wave functions themselves, the contour plots of the wave functions themselves. That's why they have the phase information, the complex phase. And you see, 
here this, this is the P, P is zero. The color doesn't change at all. Well, that's basically the phase doesn't change. P minus one and P one, well, you see you have green once. The phase just repeats itself once. If you look at these were D orbitals, these are corresponds to M is equal to two, you have green, green twice. So the phase starts from, let's say, if you start from, if green denotes zero, let's say, you start from zero, then the phase becomes two pi, and you keep going, and the phase becomes four pi, which is basically zero. And similarly, here, you have three greens. The phase just rotates around the origin three times. Now, anyway, you, are, you look tired. Any last questions before the break? Okay, let's give a, a five-minute break, and then we will continue.